All right. Um, let's get started. Uh, I'm Devise Singh. I'm the uh, chair of the steering committee for Orthopedics Overseas, which is Division of uh, Health Volunteers Overseas, who is sponsoring this virtual luncheon. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, this is the inaugural uh, session. Uh, traditionally, this is a, a meeting that's uh, held um, during the Orthopedic Academy Conference uh, annually. Um, unfortunately, that conference was canceled last year, uh, and again, uh, this year it's been rescheduled for August. But in the interim, for all of those who are starving for international travel and volunteering, uh, this is a good sort of um, substitution uh, until we can do those things again. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Karen Agarwal-Harding. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Agarwal-Harding has a very interesting background. Uh, his parents were both involved in uh, academics and teaching, uh, and particularly global uh, development uh, and education, a passion obviously that he's uh, grown on to share. Uh, he's uh, spent his childhood uh, in places as diverse as Ghana and India. Uh, he, did, he did his undergraduate work at Stanford, uh, followed by medical school at Harvard, uh, and he is now completing his orthopedic residency in the Harvard Combined Program. Uh, next year he will be starting as a hand surgery fellow at Columbia. Uh, but today he's going to talk to us about Malawi, uh, where he was uh, able to do some work uh, as part of a postdoctorate fellowship between his third and fourth years of residency. Um, he will speak for about 20-25 minutes. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have a uh, discussion uh, as time allows afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Agarwal Harding. Thanks, Divya. Really appreciate the introduction. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. There we go. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Uh, thanks also to Nancy and Andrea for putting together this talk. Uh, really, it's, a, it's an honor and a uh, pleasure to be uh, part of this. Um, and I'm glad that we're doing this after it was canceled um, uh, due to COVID last year. Uh, so my name is Karen Agarwal-Harding. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgery resident at the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Uh, and I lead a group called the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. Um, it's a group of uh, residents and faculty and medical students who share a passion for global orthopedics. Um, and so, you know, just to begin this talk, I kind of want to define what is global orthopedics. Um, this is the definition that we use as a group. Uh, it's a field that aims to understand and address the burden of musculoskeletal disease and to develop solutions to achieve musculoskeletal health equity. So before we even begin, I, I figured that we'd start from the 3,000 foot view here um, and just talk a little bit about what the global burden is, what we know already. Um, so the global burden of trauma is huge. There are more people that die every year from trauma than that die from tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV AIDS combined. And that's just deaths, right? The number of people who have injuries due to road traffic collisions, due to falls, far outnumber the people who die from trauma. And the number of injuries worldwide is increasing, but mainly because of a growth in, in the number of injuries in low and middle income countries. And uh, so today, you know, I've, I've had, I have the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work in Malawi. Malawi is a low income country, one of those countries where we are seeing a growing number of, uh, of injuries. Uh, there's a population of about 18 million people. It's a very rural country. 83% of the people in the country live in the rural areas and 51% of the population live below the national poverty line. So very poor. Um, there's also really high burden of trauma. It has the fourth highest road traffic mortality rate worldwide. Um, and uh, uh, we, we see this in the hospitals all the time. You know, there's a growing uh, number of people in the community um, who, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one second. Um, there, there's a growing number of people in the community who suffer injuries and don't receive the treatment they need. In fact, if you go into the communities, and uh, this study was done by some colleagues in Malawi, um, and you look at the amount of untreated surgical disease that exists, one third of Malawians, so something like six million Malawians are living with an untreated surgical condition. Um, and if you look specifically at those Malawians with an untreated surgical condition, 30% of them have an untreated surgical condition of the extremities. And we believe that a lot of this is probably related to musculoskeletal trauma. And we see this in the hospitals. So every year it seems that the number of fractures being admitted to Kamuzu Central Hospital, to all the district hospitals is rising every single year. 
Now, this really matters for all of us when we have a musculoskeletal injury. You know, our hands and our legs are essential for performing our daily activities, for living our lives. But for a poor rural farmer who relies on her hands to harvest her crops, for the school-aged child who has to walk hundred, you know, you know, miles and miles to get to, to get to school, um, having the function of your musculoskeletal system is really essential. Um, and the short and long-term disability for musculoskeletal injuries pushes patients into these vicious cycles of poverty that not only affect the patient themselves, but also their families, their communities, and the entire country. You know, the GDP that's lost due to musculoskeletal injuries is huge. Uh, worldwide, it's billions of dollars. Um, but the good news is that significant injury-related disability is preventable with quality surgical care. The problem here, though, is that access to surgical care is significantly limited. 5 billion people worldwide, 70% of the world population, do not have access to safe and affordable surgical and anesthesia care. And this is not equal across the world. In low and middle income countries, most of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, 90% of people have inadequate access to safe and affordable surgery. Compare that to 4% of people in high income countries like the US and the UK. So this is a situation that we have in the US. We have one orthopedic surgeon for every 11,000 Americans. Compare that to what we have in Malawi. One orthopedic surgeon for every 1.3 million Malawians. So Malawian orthopedic care is primarily delivered by the government hospitals. The government hospitals in general provide about 60% of healthcare in, you know, in general. But when it comes to trauma care, which primarily affects the poor, that is mainly provided by the government hospitals. They have the facilities to provide it and they have the largest network. Orthopedic care is provided by uh, district and central hospitals. District, there are 25 district hospitals throughout the country and four central hospitals. Um, the problem is none of these district or central hospitals have the minimum required resources to provide adequate fracture care. This is a uh, you know, nationwide survey that we performed just a few years ago uh, I visited each of these district and central hospitals. We spoke with staff there. We looked at the um, bare minimum resources required to treat fractures, diagnose, treat, and rehabilitate patients with fractures. And we found large deficits in these minimum required resources at district hospitals in all three regions of Malawi and in the central hospitals. So Malawi has 14 orthopedic surgeons. And orthopedic surgeons are all based at the central hospitals in Malawi. And 90% of orthopedic workload, because the country is a very rural country, most patients live in the rural districts, most care is provided by the orthopedic clinical officers that are stationed in these district hospitals in the rural regions. So orthopedic clinical officers are non-physician clinicians. Uh, they are trained, it takes about 18 months for them to get a diploma in trauma and orthopedics after their uh, secondary school training. Um, and uh, they're, they're trained in primarily non-operative care. So casting, splinting, wound debridements, things like that. Any patients that require surgery, they refer to a surgeon in the central hospital. So I think it may be illustrative for me to talk a little bit about the treatment of femur fracture. This is one injury that we've studied a lot in Malawi, and I think shows a little bit about how the, um, the challenges of orthopedic care manifest in, in uh, the challenges the patients experience themselves. So, um, you know, if if I were to have a femur fracture, if any of the patients at our hospitals here in Boston were to have a femur fracture, they would receive surgery. This is an intramedullary nail. This is sort of the gold standard of treatment. This allows a patient to walk immediately after uh, their surgery. Um, they can weight bear on this bone. It puts them back into the, into the world and able to perform their daily activities once the uh, fracture is healed. Um, this surgery is available at the central hospitals thanks to the sign nail, which I can get into more. Um, but it's not available to all patients, and I can talk more about that as well. But suffice to say, the central hospitals have this capacity to a limited extent. But because the majority of patients receive their care in the districts, this is how most patients in Malawi receive care for femur fracture. The vast majority of patients will receive skeletal traction, which is a fairly archaic treatment. You pay, place a pin through the proximal tibia, and you attach weights to that pin and hang that, uh, and, and then hang uh, those weights over the end of the bed. Patients are immobilized for a long period of time. Their knees get stiff. There's a high rate of the bones not healing or healing short. Um, their families have to care for them in hospital. It's devastating for their livelihoods. Um, and uh, there are limitations in the district hospitals, even when providing this very basic surgery. The pins are dull. They don't have drills to place them. 
the orthopedic surgeons on the call will appreciate that, uh, you know, when the orthopedic clinical officers have to place these dull pins, they're oftentimes malleting them in and they rely on pin tract infections to pull them. Otherwise they have to mallet them across to the other side in order to pull them out. So it, it can be quite morbid and it's, it's quite horrible to see these patients suffer this way. So that begs the question, you know, how can we help? There's so many challenges that our Malawian colleagues have to deal with. How can we help? And I've been tasked a little bit here uh, to talk a little bit about our work doing volunteerism, research and education in Malawi. Um, so at HGOC, uh, this is sort of the foundation of what we, what we think uh, we can do to assist our colleagues. So built on this firm foundation of a bilateral partnership between us and our local colleagues, we believe that research, education, advocacy, and resources are ways that we can help build towards musculoskeletal health equity. So today I'll talk a little bit about that and also where volunteerism fits into all of this. So spending time in the clinic and in the operating room for me, and I, I believe for everybody is critical to understanding the challenges on the ground. Capacity building relies on identifying and supporting local champions and anybody who's worked in a resource limited setting will, will, um, uh, will understand me here when I say that it seems at times that the entire system hangs on these local champions who hold everything up. Um, also working side by side as equal collaborators really helps build these bilateral long-term relationships, which are really important for, for capacity building in the long term. Um, so I guess I'll begin uh, talking about our journey in Malawi with just sort of one example. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the projects that we've done related to ankle fracture, and I'll start with the volunteerism bit. So I went to Malawi on one of my trips. I was there. I was volunteering and helping out um, just as a resident. I was operating with uh, Dr. Leonard Banza, who's the chief of orthopedics at Kamuza Central Hospital. Um, and this patient arrived at, through, um, uh, you know, our clinic door. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the injury films. These are actually our post-op films. Um, but uh, this patient had a trimalleolar ankle fracture dislocation um, and presented to Kamuza Central Hospital five weeks after injury. And the ankle was still dislocated and had never been splinted. And this patient had been seen by a local orthopedic clinical officer in their home district, right? So I'm sure like those orthopedic surgeons on the call can appreciate here that the lateral malleolus piece was all resorbed and was essentially gone. The medial mal was not salvageable. There was no way for us to primarily fix this ankle. So we did what you see here in the x-ray. We fused the tibio-talar joint. This is a procedure that Dr. Bonzo hadn't done a lot of. You know, he was, you know, he's a very extremely accomplished and, and uh, competent surgeon. So we were able to do this in, this in this case for this patient. It was a salvage procedure, certainly not ideal, uh, uh, not an ideal outcome for, for a patient with an ankle fracture. But it, but it raised a lot of questions. You know, I, I spoke to Leonard after, after this happened and we, we were talking, you know, why did the patient never, you know, get splinted or reduced? You know, you don't really even need an x-ray to diagnose a dislocated ankle fracture. So to even reduce the ankle fracture, say the x-ray wasn't available or something like that, even that should have at least being attempted, you know, that, that was our thought. There are so many things that happened to this poor guy that we felt like um, could, have, could have been done differently and could have perhaps prevented him needing to have his ankle joint fused. Um, so I guess that's where the research now comes in. We had all of these questions that this case provoked. And so then we wanted to dive into this a little bit deeper. So the first thing that we did is um, uh, we looked at this data that we had collected from this registry. We had four hospitals where we were looking at every single ankle, every single fracture that came through the front door of our, of our clinics. And we found, looking at that data, that ankle fractures were the most common fracture among adults presenting to orthopedic clinics. So really, really common injury. So we wanted to understand how these were being managed. So we created a knowledge assessment um, and a survey of 18 Malawian providers. These are mostly orthopedic clinical officers. These are the primary people managing patients with ankle fractures. And they represented five different hospitals. And we asked them basic questions about anatomy of an ankle, how to identify bony injuries and ligamentous injuries on x-ray, and what the ideal treatments were. Uh, we also asked them to provide, um, you know, how they would treat these ankle fractures. These were case-based questions. And unfortunately, from the knowledge assessment, we found significant deficits in these providers' knowledge of like how to identify these injuries on x-ray and also what the ideal treatment was. Also, from these cases, asking them how they would treat these injuries, we saw a lack of treatment standardization, which can be quite troubling. You know, a very common injury like a bimalleolar equivalent ankle fracture, uh, it was almost a 50-50 split 
between those who felt like it needed to be referred to a surgeon for surgery and those who felt like it didn't, right? And they were all looking at the same x-ray here. So that lack of treatment standardization was also very troubling. So then we set about um, observing the actual management of treatment, um, the actual management of ankle fractures at Kamuzu Central Hospital. Uh, this is one of our volunteers, Ami. Uh, she's a research associate uh, with the HGOC. She spent the summer in Malawi. And every patient with an ankle fracture over the course of five weeks that walked through the clinic doors at Kamuzu Central Hospital, she would um, record the treatment plans as determined by the orthopedic clinical officers, photograph the x-rays, and then back in the U.S., we had three foot and ankle trained um, orthopedic surgeons and one Malawian orthopedic surgeon uh, reading these x-rays and giving their treatment recommendations. And these are the results. There's a big difference in how these ankle fractures would have been treated by the U.S. surgeons compared to how they were being treated by the Malawian OCOs. And there was, a, I should mention here, um, near perfect agreement between the US, U.S. surgeons and the Malawian surgeon. So the Malawian OCOs were treating the vast majority of patients non-operatively, whereas the U.S. surgeons felt that the majority of patients needed surgery. Now, if you overlap these two Venn diagrams, there's about a third of patients, um, actually it's 17 patients, 35%, who met operative criteria by U.S. standards, but were receiving non-operative treatment in Malawi. Ankle fractures like this one, this uh, Weber C lateral mal, but it's a, bimalleol it's a bimalleolar ankle fracture. This is one that the U.S. surgeons felt needed surgery, and it was being recommended for non-operative treatment in Malawi. So we, we wanted to know why. What were the reasons that this treatment disparity existed? So for about half of patients, half of these patients, the Malawian OCOs stated that resources were too limited. That should be very obvious from what I presented already about the situation in Malawi, right? Um, but for the other half of patients, Malawian OCOs were stating that they gave the ideal treatment. So they were not able to identify these as displaced or unstable injuries. So this to us represented the manifestation of the knowledge deficit that we had identified in our knowledge assessment previously. So these are the key lessons that we've learned so far through the research that we did. Ankle fractures are common. Most are treated non-operatively. This is partly due to resource limitations. There are also gaps in provider knowledge of ankle fractures that manifest in, in you know, incorrect treatment or inadequate treatment. And there is no standardized treatment protocol in Malawi. So very you know, disparate treatments depending on who sees the patient right, or where they present. So that's where the education now comes in. So we designed an educational module. We had a group of volunteers from Harvard and a group of local collaborators, both at Cure and at uh, Kamuzu Central Hospital. And we worked together to create an educational module uh, that specifically uh, targeted the knowledge deficits that we'd identified in our research. So we wanted to refresh the key knowledge of providers, update Malawian providers on evidence-based guidelines for treatment of ankle fractures, and present a standardized protocol that was feasible in Malawi given our knowledge that we'd collected through various research projects on the capacity to perform orthopedic care. But we had excellent attendance from across the country, 61 participants representing 31 hospitals, uh, which was fantastic. So this is the standardized treatment protocol that we designed. This was designed in collaboration between the Malawians and the U.S. surgeons. We really benefited, I think, from the expertise of surgeons at Harvard who manage ankle fractures all the time and who've studied it and published on it, um, but also on the expertise of, of surgeons in Malawi who can understand, who obviously are orthopedic surgeons and know how to treat an ankle fracture, but also can understand what the limitations are and how we can best use the resources that are available to treat as many patients as possible. So the orthopedic surgeons on the call will recognize that what we've tried to do is push as many patients as possible towards non-operative treatment. And then the patients who do have unstable and displaced injuries, we at least have them be seen by an orthopedic surgeon so that these can be evaluated and determine whether or not surgery is possible given the availability of resources. So this is the course that we ran. It was a case-based discussion, essentially. We had a few lectures, but then we, uh, we had case, cases that we discussed. So Mabuto Chowinga is here in the corner, and this is Bonnie Chen, one of our volunteers from Harvard, going over these cases with the local OCOs. Uh, more case discussions here. This is Amanda McCoy, former graduate of the Harvard program, now currently the interim uh, uh, program director um, for orthopedics at uh, Tenwek Hospital in Kenya, actually. So she flew down, flew down from Kenya to join us. Uh, this is Dr. Kwan, another uh, Harvard orthopedic surgeon, the chief of foot and ankle at the BI, uh, teaching a bunch of orthopedic clinical officers. Uh, Mabu Tochoinga here helping him uh, put on a splint for an ankle fracture. And this is Kumbukani Manda. He's an orthopedic surgeon at um, 
uh, Kamuza Central Hospital teaching a team of orthopedic clinical officers how to put on a, an X-fix for an ankle fracture. And this is our entire group of uh, participants in the course uh, taking um, our, uh, our um, pre and post course assessment. So we, before the course, we had everybody take an assessment. Then after the course, we had everybody take an assessment the morning after. Um, and uh, that, the assessment showed that I think we hit our target for the learning objectives that we had for the course. 84% um, of providers improved their overall score. Uh, the worst performers on the pre-course assessment improved the most, and the young orthopedic clinical officers improved the most, which I think was very encouraging. Um, and, you know, we tested eight injuries, and out of eight injuries, as a cohort, on average, Malawian orthopedic clinical officers were able to identify one more injury on x-ray and knew one more ideal treatment afterwards. So it's a modest improvement, but I, I think it's a real one, and it's one that we really do hope will um, translate into better care of ankle fractures in Malawi. So this was our whole group. You know, the volunteers are here seated in the front, and then our whole group of orthopedic clinical officers and surgeons who participated in the course in 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, in the age of COVID and, of course, to continue the education that we provided during this one course, we've now developed these educational videos. Um, uh, we've done this in collaboration with the Foot and Ankle Research and Innovation Lab at MGH. Um, and uh, the purpose of these videos, they're, they're short. They're like five to ten minutes. They're easily uh, able to be passed around on WhatsApp. That's really the purpose because that's the easiest form of communication in Malawi. And the idea is they, they cover the same learning objectives we covered in our course. We're translating them into different languages now as well. And they just allow for continued reinforcement of the teaching that we did. Um, also, our Malawian colleagues are continuing the course on their own without us in the age of COVID. With, without our, we can't travel to Malawi. So our Malawian colleagues have just put on the same ankle fracture course themselves. So this is uh, Gladys Ngondo. She's an um, orthopedic uh, resident at Kamuzu Central. And this is Nancy Mwale. She's one of the orthopedic clinical officers uh, who is really being a fantastic supporter of this project. Um, and they're presenting some of the results and data from um, that I've just presented to you. Uh, and they engaged in a very lively discussion about how to improve ankle fracture care um, just a few months ago in Malawi, which was great. Uh, and this is the entire course uh, in 2020 now. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, for this is just one example, what we've done with ankle fracture. But uh, in this example, I've hope, I hope that I've shown you that uh, volunteerism really fit into our broader partnership in Malawi with this long-term capacity building as the ultimate goal. Uh, research was very critical. It helped us evaluate the need and also whether we were adequately addressing the need. Uh, and then education we felt is the most durable gift exchanged between collaborators uh, and was, uh, um, was uh, you know, we, we learned as much from our Malawian colleagues, I feel, during these trips as uh, we hope that we, uh, we taught them during these trips. Uh, so, so many people to thank, you know, both in Malawi and the US, I won't go through all these names here today, um, but uh, here's some pictures from HGOC in Malawi over the years. Um, and uh, thank you all very much. You can scan this little QR code for my contact details if uh, you'd like to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. That was excellent. Um, and it, it really speaks to a lot of what we as uh, HVO members uh, appreciate about your work uh, in that it's capacity building, it's educational based, and it really ties into the resources and personnel available uh, in all these resource poor settings. Uh, because I think so many times uh, we as American orthopedic surgeons or other healthcare providers come in with the mindset of I know how to do this, this is how we do it back home, and this is the right way. Um, and as you pointed out, turns out it's not right or wrong, it's you have to deal with the capabilities, the resources, and the education of the local providers. Um, and that's what you're going to leave, uh, not just the surgeries you do. So thank you very much for that. Um, if there are people who have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one of the questions that came up, uh, there are only 149 PTs in Malawi. Uh, do you have any knowledge in the field of PT in that country? What was your experience there? 
Yeah, um, so we, uh, in that capacity assessment, I showed a slide um, that summarized some of the data from that, uh, that study. We included uh, initial management and stabilization of patients, um, definitive treatment, both non-operative and operative, and then rehabilitation and aftercare. And a big part of the uh, rehabilitation and aftercare was um, whether there was a space in these district hospitals to perform physical therapy, whether there was a provider available to do physical therapy, uh, and whether they felt that there was adequate physical therapy de being delivered. Um, and I think it should come as no surprise to the folks on this call that unfortunately there were limitations in all of those. So the physical therapists themselves are fairly limited. They're mainly at the central hospitals. There are physical therapy techs that are available um, at many of the district hospitals. Uh, the physical space to perform physical therapy and like um, you know, the devices and tools to help patients recover um, are limited at the district hospital, severely limited in some cases. Um, crutches, canes, walkers are limited in many of these hospitals. Um, many patients have to buy their own from like local carpenters. And we're talking about, you know, vast majority of these patients live on less than a dollar a day. So to afford canes and crutches can even be a, a, a limitation for them. So there's a lot of work we need to do on physical therapy. And, you know, the problem with um, having inadequate treatment in the first place is you set yourself up for bad outcome even if you do have the availability of physical therapy. So skeletal traction, for example, I just showed that, that example. Um, a lot of these patients will have incredibly stiff knees, will have shortened limbs, malrotated limbs, um, and there's only so much you can do after a patient has been sitting in traction for four months in terms of like rehabilitating their knee stiffness, right? I'm sure the physical therapist on the call will agree with that. So um, th we, I think, really need to work in parallel, physical therapists and orthopedic surgeons and people who look at, um, you know, capacity building from the government perspective. Like everybody needs to work together and think about how we treat a patient from the moment that they have the injury to the moment that they can go back to their work. Because there are, there are barriers at every single step of the way and just focusing on one thing, just for example, um, you know, if we only focused on the treatment of ankle fractures, only focused on like teaching uh, orthopedic clinical officers how to diagnose and treat ankle fractures, and didn't take into consideration the challenges that a patient has to get to the hospital, or the challenges that they may have rehabilitating after the injury, or coming for follow-up, I think we would be doing a great disservice to the people of Malawi. So that, that I, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's important to think about physical therapy, and uh, we need to do a lot of work there as well. And uh, a somewhat similar but different uh, question relates to anesthesia care. Uh, mm -hmm. As there are limited surgeons, limited PTs, uh, did you find availability of anesthesiologists an issue uh, or particularly in determining who gets surgery and who doesn't get surgery? Um, so the anesthesiologists are only available at the central hospitals. At all the other district hospitals, there are um, CRNAs, so anesthesia nurses. Um, and uh, they tend to be available, actually, most of the time, the, the anesthesia staff. The availability of the anesthetic drugs, the ventilators, things like that is variable. It can depend, you know, it comes in waves. Sometimes they're, they're there, sometimes they're not, um, in, in my limited experience in anesthesia. We, we did ask a few questions about anesthesia in our capacity assessment, but keep in mind that most surgery is happening at the central hospitals, where the majority of resources are being concentrated. Um, but of course, anesthesia becomes a limitation when the burden of, sur of surgical patients is like so overwhelming, you know, and you can only get two or three cases done a day. And then when the resources are limited or you have traumas or emergencies that come through, it can be really challenging. So um, we've been discussing both with our colleagues in Malawi, but also with colleagues in, in our other partnerships, the role of regional anesthesia, trying to improve that capacity. You know, spinals are great for lower extremity injuries, but for upper extremity injuries, can we train local providers to do regional anesthesia so that we can fix elbows, fix um, uh, wrists and forearms without perhaps needing general anesthesia? So I, I think that we can do a lot of work here as well. And, um, you know, in fact, HGOC, just recently, we've been uh, working a lot more with our colleagues um, on the anesthesia side because we really need to be working together. Surgeons alone are useless. Um, uh, so we, we need our anesthesia colleagues to be on the same page with us and working with us on these teams, for sure. Um, 
it's sort of a follow-up to that, and I, I completely agree with that. Um, sometimes the little things make the biggest difference. Uh, I remember when I was in Malawi working with one of the OCOs, they had never learned to do a digital block. And so they had to wait for anesthesia to be able to fix something as simple as a, a revision amputation of a finger, uh, yeah. but teaching them to do the digital block opened up a whole world of possibilities. Um, yeah. So for people who are considering volunteering uh, in these resource poor settings and don't feel that they may have the specialized skills, um, we all have the skills that can help a lot, um, much more than we know. Uh, a few more questions, and this is gonna cover a little bit of the, the infrastructure issues. Um, there's a question about the factors leading to the increase in orthopedic trauma. Why does that happen? Uh, is it related to the types of cars or change in labor um, or any combination therefore? Um, and why are there so many ankle fractures? And, and how is the government uh, addressing these issues as well? So <laughs> little, little question, just fix all of that. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no problem. Uh, really great questions. Uh, so ankle fractures are super common everywhere. You know, even today, you know, I'm not operating today, obviously I'm here with you, but today we have like two ankle fractures sitting there waiting for surgery. Almost every day we will see an ankle fracture come through the door. You get an ankle fracture when you step off a curb awkwardly or when your dog trips you. You know, I mean, ankle fractures are just common, period. Um, and so it's unsurprising that they would be so common uh, in a place like Malawi where you have, you know, poorly lit roads at nighttime, you have people walking long distances, you have people relying, um, you know, on, on dirt roads full of potholes to get to and from markets and things like that. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that it's that common. Um, what it does is, is demonstrate how important it is to address these most common injuries with like teaching and capacity building and all that sort of thing. So that's really why we looked at that from that project. Um, the factors leading to the increase in orthopedic trauma. Um, so Malawi is not uh, like a particularly strong like mining country. It doesn't have any natural resources like cobalt, like in the DRC or something. So the mining sector is fairly limited. Agriculture is mainly for subsistence and for local produce. Like exporting of products is not that high. It's, it's really a landlocked, very impoverished country. Um, and it, it's started to grow a little bit in terms of the number of road, uh, motor vehicles on the road. And that I think is probably where the majority of injuries are coming from. That's certainly what we see. It's motor vehicle collisions. It's people in minibuses that are overcrowded and poorly regulated. There's not a lot of road traffic regulation. Um, now it's funny, not a lot of people own cars, but everything exists on the highway. So the Chinese government, the European governments and the World Bank have invested in Malawi infrastructure in some ways. They've built roads, these big highways. So when I visited these 25 district hospitals and four central hospitals, I was able to do all that in the course of a month because of these fantastic roads that are built by, by these foreign governments. Um, and so the, the roads that connect the city, the big cities exist. And so the people basically come to these roads for commerce and for trade. Um, and that's where kids are struck by, by motorcycles. That's where um, people are hit at nighttime. That's where people are speeding and crashing off the road. Um, you know, in, in my time bouncing back and forth from Malawi, I've seen pedestrians be run over by cars. I've seen people fly off the roads. Like it's very, very common. So I would say um, motor vehicle collisions is probably the main source of these injuries. And it's growing, it's growing like crazy. You know, we're seeing it more and more and more, these motor vehicle injuries. And actually, you know, our colleagues in Malawi, I've been in touch with them during this whole year that I've been away from Malawi because of COVID asking them, you know, what's the situation during COVID? How, how's the situation for you? Um, and COVID is much less of a problem than motor, motor vehicle injuries. Honestly, like they are inundated with motor vehicle injuries and um, their staffing is limited because of COVID. That's the manifestation of the COVID pandemic for many of our colleagues in Malawi right now, which I think is really interesting. So sort of to follow up with that, um, you obviously had buy-in from the local providers. They trusted that you knew what you were doing, one, that you were going to look out for them. Um, and, and so I think that really encouraged the collaboration aspect of things. Um, mm. Do you have any, for people who are going for two weeks to mm. Malawi, mm. any uh, suggestions or tips on how to establish that with the local people that you're hoping to serve? Yeah, uh, that's tough. That's really tough. For, t for someone to go just for two weeks and not know the country at all, it's, it's really tough to build those kind of long-term collaborations. I would 
encourage anybody who wants to go for two weeks, of course, to participate in something like that with a group like HVO or connect with folks like at HGOC who have those networks already. If you just go and exist in a vacuum, it's like really, really hard to do anything meaningful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think like at the end of the day, the reason that these projects in Malawi have been successful is because of our local champions. It's people like Mabuto Chowinga, Leonard Banza, Nicholas Lubega. These are the people who have lifted up our projects and turned them into meaningful capacity building efforts. W without them, nothing could, could happen. And so anybody who's going for a two week period, those are the people you gotta be in contact with before you even go, you know, speaking to them, understanding what the situation is and planning out that trip centered around what those local champions say is important and what they think you can most contribute during that time. Um, one of the questions is unexpected challenges in the implementation of this project um, or any changes in your study design um, following the initial sta stages. Yeah, I mean, so many challenges. Um, I, I went over a few different research projects here. Um, I've been speaking a lot about the capacity assessment project. Um, you know, we had originally designed it so that we would send these surveys by mail and have the orthopedic clinical officers respond. Of course, the you know, public infrastructure in Malawi is a huge limitation. So the, the timeline of getting responses that way was hard. We, we wanted them to be incentivized enough to respond to these surveys. So it was, it was a nightmare trying to think about how to get these surveys into the hands of these orthopedic clinical officers to provide these responses. So I ended up driving myself. Every single district hospital I went and I sat down with the orthopedic clinical officers and went through the surveys together so that they could like answer the questions and they would walk me around the hospital and like look at the number of you know, traction pins that they had available and whether where the operating room was and how many patients on the wards were sitting there with a femoral shaft fracture in skeletal traction. Um, just being there in person, I think, really helped that project proceed um, and overcome the huge burden, uh, the huge uh, bur uh, barriers that would have existed otherwise. Uh, for the ankle fractures projects, um, when we were actually collecting the data on the wards, um, there was a lot of um, you know, there, there's always the political challenges of like, oh, I want the visitor to hang out with me. I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, um, uh, you just have to work them out case by case. And again, it requires having that local, those local champions who are willing to like say, no, this, this project matters. This is something that we believe needs to be completed and it will be done in this particular way. And they can sort of like mitigate some of those kind of stranger political issues at play. Um, I hope I'm answering your question. I mean, there, there were, I can't, I can't think of any specific big things that ended up changing, uh, changing the study design. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly there were like little hurdles along the way that we had to overcome as inevitably you will have when you work in a low resource setting. Uh, so Nancy has a question as well. Um, obviously this, this whole project is based on educating the OCOs. Um, do they have availability uh, on a regular basis for continuing education? Uh, and how easy is it for them to get to a conference or to have access to all these teaching tools? Yeah, it, it's hard. So in some of these, um, some of these district hospitals, um, depending on how staffing is shifted around at the top of the ministry level, um, there may be only one orthopedic clinical officer available. Um, and so obviously that orthopedic clinical officer is on call 24 uh, seven, 365 days in a year, right? And very difficult for them to move. But in hospitals where you have two, there's an opportunity to have one person be there, one person travel. So for example, for our conference, we had 45% of, of all orthopedic providers in the country attend that conference, which was really encouraging and really fantastic. powerful. Yeah, yeah really fantastic. Um, and representing 31 hospitals. So that's almost every single uh, government hospital and then a few of the private ones as well. Um, but uh, every year there is that dedicated um, Malawi Orthopedic Association conference that we as outsiders can plug into. And that's what we did for this ankle fracture course. So that same course that we gave, there was also a team from the UK called the British, Surgeon, Sur uh, British Society for Surgeons of, what, what is it? British Society of Surgery of the Hand. And um, they led a whole day, day long course on, you know, uh, flexor tendon repairs and splinting and things like that. So it, it was very sort of, their, their course was more general, trying to cover like a lot of ground uh, as opposed to ours, which was very just focused on ankle fracture. But I think that they complemented each other quite nicely. And it was nice having another team there. We learned a lot from each other and created a nice uh, collaboration as well. So that was great. 
but, but yeah, that dedicated um, continuing medical education thing is really critical. That's a fairly new thing in Malawi, having that every year. Um, but beyond that, there's not much, unfortunately. So some of the orthopedic clinical officers will go back to school and get what's called a bachelor's of science in trauma and orthopedics. This is through the uh, College of Medicine. Um, and it gives them a little bit more of the anatomy and surgical skills. Um, and when I meet the BSC OCOs, like they, they, uh, they're, they're just like more enthusiastic about trying to take on these like harder challenges, you know, trying to learn how to do the surgeries and things like that, that they've heard about or read about or learned about from the surgeons. Um, and so some of these OCOs will do surgeries at the central hospital. Um, some of the teaching that I've done, in fact, has been uh, with the OCOs, uh, showing them like how to do a distal radius fracture or forearm fracture, things like that. Um, eventually there will be sort of like a, a move towards teaching them these surgical skills, perhaps even in the district hospitals to offload from the central hospitals. So that, that re-education, that B, BSC at the College of Medicine is great. But for us, we have tried to create a, a suite of educational resources online. Um, but even online can be tough in a low resource setting like Malawi, where you need to pay for every megabyte of data that you use. So we've created these uh, simple WhatsApp videos that can be passed around. That's sort of the lowest hanging fruit for us. Simple stuff, right? At the end of the day, we, we identified in our knowledge assessment that there was a problem in basic anatomy knowledge, basic diagnosis of fractures on x-ray. So looking at an x-ray and being able to tell what is the injury and then knowing what the ideal treatment for that injury there. I mean, you can understand why at each step the performance would be lower and lower because each one builds on the other. Um, so really our, our focus of our education has been on teaching the local providers the basics of what is this injury and how do you treat it? And then which injuries can I treat in the district hospital and which ones do I need to refer for surgery because they won't do well with non-operative care. So it, it's, it's very basic. It, it's mainly for like junior residents as well. These videos I think are very useful for our junior residents even here at Harvard to go through and learn the basics of anatomy and diagnosis. So um, they have a much broader audience, I think, and we're trying to expand these videos to other countries as well by translating into other languages. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that there's, there needs to be a role for like virtual, online, digital kind of uh, continuing education for, for the staff. Um, that, that's sort of similar to what was just asked about yeah. e-learning. Uh, and we talked about this already a little bit. Um, I think uh, most of us take for granted that everyone has access to internet and Zoom and Skype and all these various platforms. But as you pointed out, not everyone can access the internet on a reliable, on a predictable basis. Yeah. Um, so for you, you found WhatsApp to be most helpful for the Malawi OCOs. Yeah, that's right. I mean, th these sorts of sessions right now, like these uh, um, even recorded sessions or streamed live stream sessions, they're becoming more and more accessible to folks. And I think that that's a great way of doing it in countries that have like fairly good internet infrastructure. Um, even in Malawi for the surgeons, like Leonard Bonza, I speak to Leonard all the time using Zoom and Skype and things like that. And that seems to work fine. He's in the big city, but in the districts, really, really hard to get to them. And the vast majority of care in Malawi is provided in these district hospitals by rural orthopedic clinical officers. So if we really want to address care in a place like Malawi, we need to think about ways that can target those people in those communities um, rather than just the surgeons in the big cities. So, so yeah, I, I think that things that are standalone and don't require having an internet connection all the time, but are still digital that could be passed around using cell phones, that's helpful. Um, uh, so perhaps recording these sessions and turning them into a shorter format like that is helpful. Um, yeah, that, that's what we found. Of course, we're still experimenting and things change. It's a moving target. You know, as internet becomes more available, things change. When I first showed up in Malawi um, back in 2017, it was a very different situation from how it was in 2019 even. You know, things had changed. So um, we're, we're constantly trying to change our strategy there. Okay. Um, there is a question about working with local and national government officials on addressing issues, and I think particularly in terms of road traffic accidents uh, and the burden of trauma care. Uh, did you have any part in sort of those bigger picture kind of discussions with government officials? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, do you mind if I share my screen again? There's a few sure. slides that might be helpful for this point. Yeah, so those on the call from HGOC will recognize these next slides. So, you know, this is the situation we find ourselves in Malawi. We have health inequity here and health equity over here. 
and how do we build this bridge? This is our research strategy that we've developed at HGOC. These are all the different types of projects that we think are important for understanding the delivery of orthopedic care in a country. And then they're all aimed at doing this national strategic development planning, uh, which we do in collaboration with the leadership in these hospitals, as well as folks from the Ministry of Health. And then that leads us to you know, many, many different interventions that we engage in uh, that some of them can be at the policy level. Some of them can be very local, you know, like training someone how to fix an ankle fracture or, um, you know, trying to work on supply chain management so that traction pins are available in specific hospital, right? So I think that the, the purpose of the research is to understand the situation. The purpose of working closely with local collaborators is to create a core team that can then execute on the strategies that you develop together. Uh, and then the strategies really need to be at all levels, both local and national. Um, so yeah, in, in the case of um, ankle fracture, uh, we had attendance from the Ministry of Health uh, in, our, in our project. Mabuto Chawinga is actually the national representative for orthopedics to the Ministry of Health. So he helped us coordinate the study. For our capacity assessment, for example, we uh, had buy-in from the Ministry of Health to perform the study. The report was presented to the Ministry of Health. They were there. They heard me present these results at our conference, and I've given them a formal written result. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the real novelty of those sorts of projects, in my mind, is we give voice to the orthopedic clinical officers who are, in so many cases, forgotten in these conversations. The discussions can be had uh, at the Ministry by the senior leadership and oftentimes um, visiting surgeons like myself who really have no qualification to sit at a table um, and, and discuss the, um, uh, the burden of, of injury for an entire country per se, but the OCOs do because they're the ones who are seeing these patients on a daily basis. And by doing a project where we pull them and get their opinions and get their voices into the, in, uh, and then get those voices um, shared to the, to the ministry, I think is really, really important. So yeah, actually, we, through our whole work on uh, femoral shaft fracture, we've done projects across this entire bridge. We are now working on this strategic development plan. So we're assembling a team in Malawi. We've gone through all of the challenges uh, at all the different phases of care for orthopedic care delivery in the country. And we are now trying to determine what are the most urgent priorities that need addressing and then developing small teams to target those. So whether they are you know, coming up with a, a standardized operating list, um, operating room list in the central hospital so that rich patients don't jump the queue, for example, and poor patients still have equitable access to surgery. Or having um, uh, a reduction of, of um, motor vehicle collision campaigns in the communities, telling people to wear seatbelts, telling people to turn on their headlights at night, things, things like that, you know. There'll be many strategies, but the idea now is to focus on like what are the priorities and then develop teams uh, centered around that. Great. Uh, there was a question about a, from a uh, previous volunteer. What changed between 2017 and 2019? Uh, do you, I, I guess that was in reference to my question about uh, the internet or? <laughs> uh, or Malawian healthcare or b between 2017 and 2020. Has there been any changes that you've, you've noticed? Um, Malawian healthcare, um, in that time, I don't know if I would say much significant. I mean, there are small changes when like a new uh, batch of femoral nails are available or a new surgeon is available. I will say that four more orthopedic surgeons were graduated from the residency program in that time. So my slide saying Malawi has 14 orthopedic surgeons. Just a year ago, that slide said Malawi has 10 orthopedic right. surgeons, right? So that's a huge change in my opinion. Um, but, uh, but other than that, you know, I, I have, in terms of the country as a whole, there's been a lot of political changes that are happening. Um, they just went through a big election cycle and there's been a lot of attention in the public placed on infrastructure and health system, uh, healthcare delivery, uh, which I think is new in my opinion. Um, in terms of internet, you know, my ability to connect to the internet, even on my phone, to have like a chip uh, to put into my phone and connect to the internet, that, that has all become much easier. The system of, uh, it first started in Kenya of M-Pesa, like mobile money, is now new in Malawi and that's allowed people to pass money around much easily like financial uh, solvency is like uh, is, is a real thing now uh, for a lot of folks in uh, um, in Malawi which is great so yeah I mean every every year it's hard to really um, for some reason I can't pull any more examples from my head right now but every time I go to Malawi it's funny things just seem to have changed just a little bit 
you know, which is encouraging, but it can also be demoralizing in some cases. <laughs> like suddenly the ICU doesn't have any good working ventilators or something like that will happen. Or suddenly like now we can't, um, we can't use a C-arm anymore. The C-arm's broken, you know, things, things like that can set us back as well. So it's always a moving target. Um, you've mentioned it a little bit, but I just want to elaborate, uh, have you elaborate a little bit about uh, the Harvard Global Orthopedic Collaborative. Uh, what is it? Uh, how are you involved? And how can other people be involved if it's something they're interested in? Sure. Um, well, so uh, our group is um, uh, a, a, an informal collection of, of folks from the Harvard system and also beyond. Uh, who share our interest in dealing with um, uh, musculoskeletal health equity. Uh, now it started really, th there are a few different folks at Harvard who engage in um, what I would say sustainable development projects with regards to orthopedic care. So we have George Dyer, who since the earthquake in 2010 has been involved in um, developing education uh, for the uh, Haitian residents uh, there. Um, and then there's Colin May, who has been going to, um, he, he works at Boston Children's Hospital. He's been going to Columbia now for several years. And they, it started off as a mission trip, but every year they've now integrated projects to look at their outcomes. They do training and education for the local folks there um, at, a, at a hospital that basically has zero orthopedic capacity. Um, so they, they're trying to augment that capacity. So these sorts of projects were existing. Like I, I worked with George Dyer back in 2012 when I was a medical student and we started the first um, uh, Haitian uh, assembly of orthopedic for orthopedic trauma um, uh, back in uh, 2012 or 2013. Um, and so the, these projects existed, but there wasn't really a way of sharing ideas between all of us. So that's really where the idea of HGOC came from. What I wanted to do when I started working in Malawi is just have all of us come to a room, gather around a pizza box as it started off, and just like share ideas about how, how's it going in Malawi? How's it going in Colombia? What can we learn and, and adapt and contribute in, in Malawi and Haiti? And um, that's where the conversation began. And then slowly over time, we started to develop, as I just showed in that slide, um, a strategy for research projects that helped us really build meaningful collaborations with our local partners um, and then start to execute on these capacity improvement projects, whether it was in the form of education or advocacy or in the case of resources. So you know, um, a, a good example is we were connected with some folks in Cameroon who told us that they had, um, they, they were now starting to see a growing volume of trauma during COVID because international missionaries were starting to leave. And all of these patients due to the conflicts, both in the North because of Boko Haram and in the South between the Anglophone and Francophone region of Cameroon was starting to produce a lot of trauma that they were seeing. And one big problem they had was uh, management of open fractures and they needed VACs. They needed VAC devices. So uh, th these are negative pressure wound therapy devices. They're like pumps that create negative pressure for wounds for those who don't know. Um, and so what we did is, you know, learning from our colleagues in, in Haiti who had had that same issue and had built these negative pressure wound therapy devices, these pumps out of fish tank pumps. I built a bunch in my kitchen and tested them and sent them to Cameroon where now they're being used to create negative pressure uh, to help uh, with wound healing for these patients. And now we're engaging with those colleagues in Cameroon to develop a research study to longitudinally look at whether or not these patients actually do have good outcomes from negative pressure wound therapy in, the, in, in that kind of setting. Um, so that, that's just one example where we're trying to deal with resources and education. But of course, the example I gave in Malawi about resources and, um, and uh, sorry, uh, research and education. And uh, yeah, I mean, many, all of our partnerships are very different in their style and different in, in their target because the challenges are different but they all learn from each other. The purpose is to create this open forum where we discuss these challenges. And I think the wonderful thing about being in a place like Harvard is we can uh, bring in collaborators from many, many different institutions. For example, those education videos that we did on ankle fracture were designed by our colleagues at the Foot and Ankle Research and Innovation Lab at MGH. Um, we uh, you know, are thinking about developing strategies for um, improving access to orthopedic care from a business side. You know, How can we use cross subsidization techniques and different business models to make care more available to the poor. I've been speaking to colleagues at the Harvard Business School about that, right? We're engaging in a project right now in Malawi thinking about how to improve access to hemiarthroplasty. Most patients in, in Malawi, elderly patients with femoral neck fractures get zero treatment essentially. They get skin traction until they have no pain, which can be four or five months later, and then they're sent home with crutches, right? 
Here in this country, we would give those patients hemiarthroplasty. And the reason that that doesn't exist is because the skills don't necessarily exist at the central hospital and the resources, the actual implants don't exist. So at HGOC, we're trying to work with local partners and with other collaborators around the world to provide those cheap implants that are reliable and safe and tested and then create an educational platform where we can actually train local providers how to use them and then longitudinally study how they're being done. And I think like things like that have enormous potential to partner with perhaps HVO and other international volunteer organizations. I mean, is there a role for volunteers coming in and out of the country focused on these specific capacity development projects that we know are important because of the research that we've done and then follow these patients longitudinally and show that there's a benefit to the work that we're doing together. So I, I think what HGOC really is all about is trying to create that network and trying to facilitate these conversations and bring in the resources that we have at our fingertips at a place like Harvard into the fray so to speak, like for what we're trying to deal with with each of our partners. Great. Well, it's uh, almost 11, um, so thank you very much. We did have a last question about uh, common infectious diseases uh, in Malawi. Oh, HIV, incredibly <laughs> common. Yeah, still, still very, very common. Uh, in fact, there's been a bunch of research done by our colleagues in the UK and in uh, uh, Norway on um, you know, uh, arthroplasty in an HIV positive patient, fracture care in HIV positive patients. HIV is very, very common. We deal with it a lot there. Okay. Great. So I just want to thank everyone, uh, but particularly uh, Kieran for leading this excellent talk. Uh, very interesting, very enlightening, uh, and, and quite groundbreaking, I think, in, in, sort of in terms of uh, bridging all these different organizations and ideas uh, and infrastructure, um, because I think as surgeons, we sort of get focused on, um, on our one thing. Um, Nancy, if you don't mind, could you put in the email for... Uh... Oh, here, I can, I can put my slide up so that people can see it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I would love to, love to hear from anybody. Great. Um, and if you've enjoyed this talk uh, as much as I have uh, and have ideas for other talks or suggested speakers, uh, we would be very um, appreciative uh, if you could email those to us as well at HBO. Um, and once again, I want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks, Divya. Thanks, Karen. <laughs>